place that we're planning. Uh, I mean, sex and FCF do a few trailers, but because there are so many events and uh, the experience yesterday, events were running over, over time, we thought that we, uh, we could start um, 50 minister terms uh, before uh, we finish the opening, opening segment. Uh, we will uh, give you the opportunity, or if it comes to the final, we will give you the opportunity for five minutes to, 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 say, to, say, to say something. Now, as a um, moderator today, uh, we are going to I'm going to take you through this session on harnessing the African continent of uh, or Africa's industrialization. Uh, fostering competitiveness and sustainability in the digital area era. Uh, we are going to look at the nexus uh, between uh, three things that is green finance, uh, digital trade, and industrialization, and how these can reinforce each other for a successful uh, implementation of the uh, AFCMCA. Uh, we have to have um, a panel which I think I want to talk about. Uh, about now before uh, the opening segment. Um, uh, we have three uh, panelists who are joining us today. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Hubert Danso. Uh, Hubert is a renowned investment leader and chairman of Africa Investor Group, uh, the Africa Green Infrastructure Investment Bank, and the African Union Continental Business Network, that's the CBN. We also have with us here, uh, Mr. Treasurer Mapanga. Um, uh, Treasurer, welcome back to this uh, area, to this city where so much work was done under your, under your leadership. Uh, she is uh, currently the Chief Operating Officer of uh, AE Trade Group and former Trade Industrialization Director at the African Union Commission. Uh, we also have um, Professor Adeolu Adewuyi uh, from the University of Ibadan. And he has also been, he has, he's actually a, a, a long term research partner uh, of uh, ECA. If, before I give the floor to uh, our executive secretary, let me say that again, we want to interrogate the nexus between green finance, uh, digital trade, and industrialization, and how this can be, can come together to, uh, for a successful implementation of the AFCFTA. And it is our objective during this uh, session uh, that policymakers and also member states, uh, including those who are joining us uh, online, um, have um, a better understanding on the green financing mechanisms and how these can be channeled to economic diversification programs. This, of course, will go a long way in getting African countries implement uh, robust strategies for green finance, for adaptation, and of course, an invest, of course, investment in sectors that are prone to bring out structural transformation. Uh, we also hope that policymakers and member states will have a better understanding of the real potential of digital trade in deepening intra-African trade and the AFCFTA that will ultimately benefit the manufacturing sector in the continent and finally, policymakers and member states, we hope, will understand the need to create an enabling environment for targeted green, green investments that reduce greenhouse gas emissions and build uh, economic uh, resilience. I would now like to give the floor then to Your Excellency Antonio Petro uh, for your opening remarks. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And to welcome all of you to the side event on harnessing the African continent of free trade area for Africa's industrialization, fostering competitiveness and sustainability in the digital era, which is an invitation to reflect on three key dimensions if we are, if we are to realize the full benefits of the CFTA. Leveraging green financing and digitalization, for industrialization and structural transformation of the African economies. We are gathering just after the United Nations Conference of Parties on Climate Change. Which came to a historic conclusion in Sheikh on Sunday. 
with a decision to compensate for the losses and damages for vulnerable nations. We've been severely affected by climate disasters. In spite of a challenging geopolitical environment, parties delivered a package of conclusions that reaffirmed their commitment. So as I said, the parties delivered a package of resolutions that reaffirmed their commitment to keeping global temperatures increases to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. The package also boosted the financial, technological, technological and capacity building assistance that development nations need to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases. So uh, to, uh, to, act to, um, to help developing nations need to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases and adapt to the inevitable effects of climate change. Additional contributions totaling more than $230 million were made to the adaptation fund. <laughs> To practical adaptation strategies, these commitments will assist many more vulnerable communities in adapting to climate change. These decisions open a window of opportunity for countries like Niger and many others on the Indo continent that are severely impacted by the devastating effects of climate change without taking any part in generating them. We must therefore think on how we can leverage on this momentum to access stable and predictable financing for structured transformation of the economies on the continent. A preliminary assessment of the voluntary carbon market led by Delberg and ECA based on partial satellite data, indicated that carbon credits can generate up to $82 billion at $120 per ton of CO2 equivalent using natural gas sequestration. So um, while current prices for carbon credits in Africa remain low, the need for accelerated action on climate change and the implementation of Article 6 of the Paris Agreement are expected to drive prices up to the benefit of African countries to be able to monetize their natural capital. ECA is supporting the Congo Basin Climate Commission to deliver a high integrity carbon credit register to help raise the value of credits issued in the region. Ladies and gentlemen, a promising vehicle to sustainable industrialization is digitalization. This is ep epitomized by the Africa Trade Exchange Platform, ATEX, whereby ECA and the African Export Import Bank, Africa Zimbank, together with the AFCFTA Secretariat, has developed a business-to-business -business and business-to-government digital trade platform 
that facilitates intra-African trade within the context of the AFCFTA. ATEX was repurposed to assist African countries to deal with shortage of food, fuel, and fertilizer many Africans are experiencing due to the Ukraine crisis. By pulling Africa's demand, ATEX ensures stronger market power, facilitate pool procurement, and hence provide one point of competitive access to critical supplies. The ATEX is a clear demonstration of how regional trade can help channeling critical commodities where it is needed most in Africa. In addition, ECA is gathering and analyzing data related to the regulatory regime governing digital trade on the continent. So our Af African Trade Policy Center, we are conducting a training and research initiative to go or gauge the uh, readiness of African countries to effectively engage in digital trade and e-commerce. This research seeks to gain insight on both measures of digital trade services restrictiveness in line with the OECD Digital Services Trade Restrictiveness Index and measures digital trade integration to help form a regional digital trade integration index for Africa. During the launch of the African Nationalization Week 2022 last Sunday, and throughout these week-long celebrations, there is a clear consensus that this year's team, industrializing Africa, renewed commitment towards inclusive and sustained industrialization and economic diversification, stressed the need for accelerating industrialization in Africa as a means to strengthen its ability to navigate a changing geopolitical landscape where nearshoring appears to be an effective response to potential disruption of global supply chains. The disruption of global supply chains also opens a window of opportunity to harness the strategic commodity-oriented industrialization in a climate-friendly manner. Africa has the huge potential of embracing this shift through targeted investments in commodity value chains, including in the framework of the Africa Mining Vision that sets actionable priorities for Africa's mining sector that can become a key enabler of a diversified, vibrant, and globally competitive industrial African economy. Accelerating productive transformation in this strategic sector requires a strategic shift from the traditional extraction and export of commodities to massive investments in productive transformation and industrialization in Africa. The significance of the CFTA in the pursuit of Africa's industrialization agenda made in African countries target industrialization as the core of the ASFTA project. Industrialization has been seen therefore by the Africa's Union regional economic communities to play a critical role in regional integration and development agendas. Inter-regional trade has particular potential to facilitate increased economies of scale, diversification, and value addition. And this is particularly important, I mean, if we take into consideration where we are starting from. I mean, our over average uh, into African trade between 16 and 19 percent. If you compare that with other regions, uh, other continents, where I mean they are 60 percent and above, then it makes sense what we are talking about today. <clears throat> A major objective of the CFTA is to foster competitiveness at industry and enterprise levels via exploitation of opportunities for scale production, improved market access, and efficiency in resource allocation. For the realization of CFT objectives, therefore, African countries would need to articulate effective policies, strategies, and programs, as well as a concrete action plan, or as well as concrete action plans for trade promotion 
and export by identifying new opportunities for diversification, industrialization, and value chain development. In the inaugural day of this, of this week, we did say that this is a business uh, that um, requires the participation of, of all sectors of government beyond the industry and trade clusters. And I think this is an important message moving forward. As we reflect on the nexus between green finance, digitalization, and industrialization in Africa, let's all be mindful that we are talking about the core of sustained development goals in Agenda 2063. And it is my sincere hope that we can come up with the right policy directions of the CFTA to thrive and take us to the promised land of peaceful and prosperous Africa. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, so now we're going to have um, a short uh, transition, as I call uh, my panelists there uh, today. I would like to answer you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you there, Tenso, uh, uh, please uh, come take a seat here. Uh, treasure, uh, Anga, yeah, uh, also comment. Yeah. So we've talked, um, we've had about uh, the need for the need for finance, uh, we've had about the question of digitalization. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to give the focus to Danso. And uh, Dr. Danso, uh, in about 10 minutes, um, can you please um, tell us a bit about the, what the investment community is doing on green financing and digitalization um, so that at least we see the limits that we have had between that effort and digitalization? Uh, thank you very much, um, Chair. It's a, it's a real pleasure. It's uh, always good for the investment community in the private sector to have uh, such a platform, so we appreciate that. Um, actually, I'd like to recognise, uh, in his absence, His Excellency Dr. Abdul uh, Rabio, the Minister of Planning of the Republic of Niger, um, who we trust will be joining us shortly, and of course, His Excellency um, Antonio Pedro, the Acting Executive Secretary of ECA, for those uh, excellent and uh, and on point um, remarks. You know this subject, as you say, we're talking about a nexus of trade, uh, industrialization, and digitization. Um, one would say, well, the investment community only do one thing. But I think if we go back to our, as long as you don't ask me to interpret. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so if we go back to our history and we begin to look at the you know institutional arrangements there was a very interesting statement made by the incoming director general um, of the first um world trade organization when it was transitioning from the general agreement on trade and tariffs gap and the statement that he made was effectively that we invest to trade and we trade uh, to invest so as investors we are very integral and uh, very committed to seeing that nexus um, naturally materialize and optimize all of the associated uh, opportunities. But as we look at green uh, finance and investment in particular, I think we've heard many different numbers uh, shared, but in you know the data that, that, that is really out there for us is the fact that Africa has to mobilize three trillion uh, US dollars for our nationally determined contribution projects by the year 2030. And that's against the backdrop of the world only mobilizing about $2.8 trillion in the last 20 years, of, of which about only 2% of that came, of that global sum actually came to Africa. So what does that mean? That, that, that means that we on the continent have to mobilize more investment in the next eight years for our nationally determined contribution projects than the world was able to mobilize in the last 20 years from the year 2000 to the year 2020. So that means that there's absolutely no question um, that we need to co-create initiatives and um, future fit business models and platforms 
to make mobilizing private capital at scale uh, for African trade and investment opportunities the expectation uh, and not uh, the uh, exception. I mean, there are many different sort of finance instruments that can contribute towards that process. Green bonds, export credit agency, bank loans, digitized trade finances, supply chain instruments. We've heard about carbon credits. I think the installment and endowment that we have from a natural capital perspective has been quantified by the African Development Bank to be in the order of about, uh, in terms of carbon credit headroom, to be in the order of about $4.6 trillion that we have in the continent between now and 2030. So we, we are not without assets as well as uh, opportunities. But that being said, we also know that the African continental free trade areas uh, key goals will not be achieved uh, without an exponential increase of institutional investment in our logistics and trade related uh, infrastructure uh, assets. So, Chair, you asked me to just sort of share some of the things that we are, we are working on in that respect. So, so from the domestic institutional investors perspective, so African pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, uh, we as a collective um, under the Continental Business Network, which is a program run out of the African Union with our secretariat at the uh, you know, African Union Development Agency, we have three major initiatives as the African asset owner community. And we all, and these initiatives essentially have the overarching goal to design and deliver greater public private finance mandate alignment. We all have our own mandates. Um, the challenge comes when the private sector expect the governments to do what governments are not mandated to do. And, and when the public sector expect the private investment community to do what we are not mandated to do. So it's very important that we continue to strive to ensure that we can optimize those opportunities around our mandates, targeting this $3 trillion of investment need, um, and, and that it can be implemented through institutional investor public partnerships, which is a move away from the core PPP model, which was designed at a different time for a different outcome uh, as a key channel to mobilize uh, private capital. If we expect to be able to achieve our goals in the next eight years, we cannot use a PPP instrument that on average takes nine years to close a transaction, 12 years if we are lucky, and it doesn't typically accommodate the scale and the size of the transactions um, that we need. So our first initiative as the investment community was to establish uh, the African Green Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, which is an African Union convened and supported African institutional investor-led uh, global finance initiative uh, to catalyze private capital for Africa's green uh, transition um, from and, and with a particular target on this $200 trillion pool of global institutional assets. And in fact, it was actually launched um, alongside and in collaboration with uh, UNECA during the Ministers of Finance uh, meeting in 2021 20, uh, when we first announced it to the Ministers of uh, Finance. And I think, what are we saying? We're saying that if we are looking forward, you know, we have to go for, we have to be talking in the trillions because that is what the data is saying. The, the data is saying that based on detailed analysis from earth systems scientists about the types of interventions that will be required and the cost of those interventions uh, to be able to accomplish our, our, climate, our climate goals. And the nexus here is that we, always want to encourage that as we begin to look at these big numbers that, that are sort of overwhelming in some respects, we also understand that they encapsulate many opportunities. That $3 trillion of investment of which Alliance in France now as the asset manager are now actually saying it's $7 trillion, actually have to be spent somewhere. So we can industrialize and create the opportunities leveraging the African continental free trade area to actually align our ability to develop these green technologies and these transition opportunities as a very specific strategy, as a strategy to industrialize and leverage. If we're not careful, we will be thinking that let's raise 3 trillion, let's spend it on overseas technologies, and we, do, we haven't developed any intellectual property, we haven't developed any industries, and then we'll be in debt. 
um, and we've we've already begun to see the the whole debt challenge um, presenting itself. So at the uh, African Green Infrastructure Investment Bank, we are bringing together uh, domestic pension and sovereign wealth fund capital um, to be able to better catalyze uh, and reduce. Um, the cost of finance for uh, our continent to be able to take advantage of some of these green uh, finance uh, opportunities. So we're effectively going to be an investor in the manager of green infrastructure assets and really work to mobilize private capital at scale, um, bringing on board additional finance as opposed to displaced government investors, which is what we see a lot of in the market. We see certain institutions actually crowding out um, the private sector as opposed to crowding us in. And that's where we are talking about the, the mandate alignment. So there we are investing across, you know, a number of different sort of sectors, uh, wind, solar, waste recycling, and biomass energy production, agriculture, water, transport and green supply chains, and digital uh, uh, infrastructure assets. And that's the uh, largest consortium of African and global uh, institutional investors as a collective representing over $20 trillion of assets under management, we are committed uh, to being innovative by building and strengthening the African green uh, infrastructure investment market, not simply serving it. If we continue to serve the way that we do things now, we will get the same result. We will take many years to put in place a single transaction and the climate science will just continually go against us. So we need to continually think about how to execute at scale um, and how to deploy that capital at speed. Eight years, $3 trillion. A lot of us are still talking in the hundreds of millions at a stretch in the billions. So we, that mindset needs to really shift. And one of the things we saw um, during COP last year uh, in terms of why is the green finance not coming to Africa? There were two major blockers that were raised. Uh, the first one was that there's not that we don't have a consistent legal and regulatory framework that's conducive for capital to be mobilized um, at scale, and for that capital to then be deployed at speed. We can invest in developing uh, various industrial uh, and infrastructure related projects, but how long does it then take to reach financial close? So we need uh, you know, a transparent legal and regulatory framework to be able to accomplish that. The second key blocker for um, private um, capital and green finance to be mobilized at scale for Africa was the lack of de-risking from multilateral development uh, banks. And we saw a lot of that. It's actually made its way into the final text of the um, COP27 agreement that we need to see a very significant change in the constellation of the players associated with mobilizing green investment uh, for Africa. In other words, if you look at the assets that we need, three trillion, seven trillion, and you look at the very dominant role that multilateral development banks have as it relates to our own mobilization of financing needs, we're talking about a $1.5 trillion collective balance sheet of all multilateral development banks combined. Um, now you compare that, and that's where we spend a lot of our time as governments. It's all MDBs, it's all, you know, that's where we obsess. Now, to the detriment of not engaging the $200 trillion pool of long-term capital, which is much better aligned to the types of long-term transitional, just uh, energy transition related industrial investment that we need. We need more patient capital, more productive and growth or oriented capital. So during COP27, we launched two initiatives. Um, we launched uh, and drafted a model law on institutional investor public partnerships. Um, it was a 130 page piece of legislation that we commissioned the uh, global law firm DLA Piper to put together. Um, we worked on that with the uh, African Union, we consulted ministers, we consulted project developers, we consulted domestic and global institutional investors to be able to put in place a very robust legal and regulatory framework, which we believe um, will go a long way to assist them to mobilize green uh, infrastructure finance and investment at scale, and it will create the local conditions through the, the, the procurement mechanisms for that capital to be deployed at speed. And what we hope 
is that many of our local businesses will be the ones that receive those opportunities so that they can actually grow and industrialize. So please, ministers, uh, government friends and colleagues, let's ready our own private sectors. Let's not be sitting back and saying, my goodness, three trillion, where are we going to get it? Let's say there's three trillion dollars worth of industrial opportunity that we should be aligning our markets, aligning our private sectors to be able to uh, participate in that opportunity. And uh, the other uh, the area that we launched was the uh, multilateral development bank shareholder-led reform agenda. Um, and that was a, a paper that we put together um, as the African institutional investment community with delight. And it sets out one operational and five governance um, specifics that we need our, uh, our, our shareholder representatives um, as the ambassadors of African heads of state who are the supreme governors um, of the multilateral development banks to be able to execute on, which gives a much bigger climate focus, which talks about reorienting the mandate. Um, there's a specific clause in there that reorients the mandate uh, within the MDBs so that we can actually provide more catalytic uh, financing opportunities, <laughs> green financing opportunities, specifically linked to African nationally uh, determined uh, contribution uh, projects. Second initiative, very quickly, is um, again, I hear a lot about clusters. I hear a lot about private sector. We hear a lot about needs. Um, in our view, there is a bigger opportunity or a lot of effort into you know, creating all of the local conditions, and there's no bias uh, for our goods. And we know that this is, there are historic reasons uh, for that, but that doesn't mean as we look to the future, we cannot begin to address that. So we know that Africa doesn't just need a transition, a green transition. We need a just energy uh, transition. And in the context of our just energy transition, we launched the COP27, um, the Just uh, uh, Transition Investors Alliance, which is an investor-led platform for green technology and energy customers uh, seeking to procure finished goods finished goods from uh, African just uh, transition green uh, economic zones, predominantly located in places economically uh, dependent on mining and highly carbon uh, intensive industries that ultimately will be recognized by the African continental free trade area. And if we're talking about the future, we have to understand that we need to have different theories of change and we need to have different ways to approach things uh, given the scale that we need and the time we need to be able to execute that on. And our overarching theory of change is that institutional investors as universal owners, that basically means that as pension funds and as sovereign funds, we own the public market and we own the private market, which means that we can influence buying behaviors um, of our portfolio companies. So that overarching sort of theory of change that we're delivering through the Just Transition Investors Alliance is that as investors, as universal owners, and our investee company corporates as customers and multilateral development banks, regional banks, um, development finance institutions, as private capital credit enhancers. In other words, they can better de-risk the $200 trillion coming in to solve our three to $7 trillion problem instead of potentially continuing to give the impression that a $1.5 trillion balance sheet by providing loans can fill a seven trillion dollar gap. So we believe that that theory of change, uh, you know, and that constellation of players um, has a pivotal role to play in positively influencing Africa's just energy transition and equitable and equitable increased participation in global value chains for finished goods uh, and green technologies. And of course, we believe that will assist uh, African and global policymakers to prioritize institutional investor public partnerships to accelerate that process as a core ESG uh, issue, uh, environment, social and governance issue. And of course, when we're talking about a just energy transition, um, you know, as we say in the investment community, the acronym for ESG, you know, we say that the E is the net present value of the S. There's no point in us uh, focusing all of our time and investment on addressing the environment if we're displacing our own brothers and sisters and families 
uh, as a consequence. So as we transition, it's not a transition we're looking for. We're looking for uh, a, a, a just energy transition. So we know that we can focus on the S and companies and investors have a mandate to be able to deliver on that. We also are linking that into sustainable development goals uh, and the attainment of that. Specifically, sustainable development goal number nine being industrialization for our purposes. Sustainable development goal number 10, which addresses inequality. If we turn around and say, well, there's not enough uh, women on our board, or if there are not enough um, you know, uh, people of color in a company, we can turn around and say that's discrimination. We can also say that is discrimination in the absence of Africa being marginalized for a long time to be the supplier of just uh, raw uh, materials. So companies are now recognizing that they can now specifically as part of the ESG, ask companies to say, what percentage of your value chain so we don't have to wait for government to regulate. What percentage of your value chain is finished goods from Africa? And they will be assessed uh, on that basis. And just to conclude there, Chair, um, one of the key that, you know, you can go to jtia.biz is the website where you can find more information. But a key part, just to link into what we're saying here, a key part of the five-part program for the Just Transition um, Investors Alliance is to digitize support and onboard uh, SME suppliers, particularly women and youth, uh, to the Africa PLC E-Trade uh, marketplace to provide access to the 10 trillion per annum and growing global green industrial value chains and procurement opportunities and provide market access uh, and capacity building tools and resources. And this is the thing I think we should have in our minds. There is a $10 trillion and growing global green industrial economy. We have more natural capital than anywhere or any other continent in the world. In exadural terms, we have five times more exadrals than Europe and North America that we can securitize. And we know that it's about $4.6 trillion. The rest of the world has to decarbonize. They're being penalized from a regulatory standpoint by having carbon intensive manufacturing processes. At the same time, the continent has to industrialize. So we can take that natural capital and decarbonize not only our own industrialization, but also that um, of our global peers, and then collectively have a direct access, not only to use the African continental free trade area um, as our home market, uh, supplying our own goods um, to take advantage of this multi-trillion dollar you know, a transition opportunity, but we can then sell in to that global $10 trillion green global industrial economy. I never hear anyone talk about the $10 trillion global green industrial economy and what percentage. Uh, it's so strange, I was going to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on how and you see the transition between the Africa and the very first of industrialization. And economic that is economic that is education in the AFCFTA. And maybe you can also uh, expand a little bit more on the growth of services that are going to be catalyzed. Uh, but, um, and of course, you need e trade. Uh, any e trade, there are a lot of constraints that, um, that have to come. And how do you create that sustainable development by the two projects? So, please, you have a Thank you. Thank you very much. Stephen, I want to give my respects to um, the acting secretary who is on the last year. I want to also give um, my distinguished as well as this wonderful audience that I hope will be here. I want to just say uh, what a great um, opportunity for me to be invited by Kenny Sage to be part of this panel. And I will respond to the question that you said, but I want to also commend the previous speaker for creating a very exciting context. Because oftentimes, as Africans, there's doom and gloom. We talk about the scarcity mindset instead of the abundance mindset. And I think you really set the tone so well and I'm happy. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to deep dive to the grassroots. And uh, I want to approach 
the whole question of how the African continental and uh, future area can be a, a major opportunity for digital trade. Uh, of course, digital trade is a, is a huge business um, in itself. Um, and I think e commerce estimates that were made last year, I think by Amtai globally, we're talking about $26 trillion. So this is not small change. But what is, of course, also true is that as Africa, we only command about 1% of that. So it's a very humble place that we're starting from. But we, as the trade group, are very optimistic that we can work together and harvest um, a multifaceted initiative working with all the stakeholders to really move the needle in terms of where we are. So the ACFJ context is a wonderful um, place to start even in terms of your question because there is no doubt that it is a, a, a major milestone that we have reached and it was always the intention for it not to be just about trade but about catalyzing um, industrialization and especially quality products from all over the continent to take advantage of this growing uh, market um, uh, space that is being created by the United States. So we're talking about the, the opportunity around a scalable market. Most small businesses, as you know, only think about their, their, their own community. They're often not thinking uh, across, um, across the borders. They're not thinking necessarily across the continent. But what digital trade can do and is doing in our experience is really working with them to shift that mindset. So our first point of intervention uh, is in interrogating how we can get the businesses that are working in a survival mode to start thinking about competitiveness with the lure of this attractive market. But what is at the end of it? Is it just about markets? No. And at the end of the day, from the continental perspective, what we need to do is to leverage these technologies, digital trade amongst also many other aspects of a digital um, economy to um, be able to create jobs on a large scale. So what we need to be thinking about is how do we do that? And we have actually a framework that we are rolling out as the agent group, working in partnership with the African Union um, and stakeholders who are part of an ecosystem that we are deliberately building around the whole notion of inclusion. Because one of the risks, uh, you talk about sustainability from a green finance perspective, but if we uh, are not taking on board uh, the citizens on the continent and, and creating opportunities for them to be part of this exciting new emerging um, landscape, we would have lost this world at the ACFTA will not deliver anything of note. I want to also just recognize my sister here, we were with her in Tanzania, where the president of Tanzania is championing the Women in Trade Protocol under the AFCFTA. So it's extremely important that we look at uh, with the way we need to think about all the different protocols is how to mainstream and target this very important demographic that we have, which is a youthful continent, first and foremost, but also a continent that has women that have often been left behind. So let's not dig that deeper into um, what it is that we are doing on digital trade. Um, as we have heard, there are many platforms. There's a platform that is there. We have well, the Sohu.Africa, which is a, a digital capacity building platform. The whole idea we approached, the design of it was that it needs to be a practical place, a platform for hand-holding small businesses to start their journey on learning how to. So it's learning by doing. And it starts with a learning center, with, which basically has, in, in it actually we have a program for changing the mindset, and it's in four languages, and we take them through the understanding of what the African Union is doing in opening up the space, but also challenging them to look at leadership best practices and look at how they forge their business plans to be aligned to these new opportunities. And that's why when you were talking, I was thinking we need to have definitely a module that looks at this kind of information, you know, distilled and made very simple for small businesses to understand why should they be thinking about green, you know, moving towards the green products, looking at sustainability standards, looking working with the Pan-African quality infrastructure to create this pipeline of products that will actually be able to uh, qualify 
for uh, this very lucrative market that is uh, already there. So what is it that um, we found in terms of lessons learned in this idea of bringing digital trade to the classrooms? We have found that SMBs, first of all, they need visibility. We don't know what we're producing in Africa or not. So that's what a digital platform does. So the starting point is having them uh, on board and have those products um, available. And then also doing the support in terms of quality standards, avoiding with the business strategies to ensure that there is actually a market. Now, we are working in a model that also does not disadvantage informal businesses. You don't have to be registered to be in the platform to showcase what you do. But of course, once you start trading, the KYC kicks in and you need to be registered. And then you also will be paying taxes, of course, as part of that journey. So it's a, it's a model that we are you know, we're testing out and we're rolling out. And we think that we are onto something because a lot of small businesses, especially the inform many will remain informal, by the way, that's my belief. We're not going to get everyone. But the getting out of the informal uh, space allows them to have growth because the next part of Sohuku is access to affordable finance. We have within the platform a de risking um, a vetting system right, that we have set up, which is linked to basically the data that you collect on a platform where you have clients who are learning in the platform, clients who are training in the platform. So we are basically bringing this also as a solution for commercial banks or for anyone who wants to use it because we have to find a way to bring uh, finance uh, affordable finance to the SMEs. And so this is a, a second part of that. Now, SMEs are also themselves needing commercial intelligence. At the moment, they just go blind into the market. It's like, you know, from swimming in a swimming pool and going into the ocean, <laughs> you know, when you're talking about an African market. So we have thought deliberately about this and said big data for SMEs. Um, how can we leverage and use that analytical capacity to give them information that will help them to be um, more competitive? And for that, we have we are setting up starting in Pilani a research and innovation center um, framework where. In that space, we will be working with academia, with, research, with industry, with different stakeholders to not do research about SMEs, but research for SMEs. And this is a critical distinction that I want to make. So, and what we are also uh, bringing in our model of the governments, because we are partnering with African governments, and we all know that they need an enabling environment. And for digital trade, there is, of course, the protocol of digital trade that I know AECA is busy supporting with. But we are coming from that also from a tactical experience. You know, what is working? Because the risk for our negotiators is to set up a regulatory framework that actually stifles the fintechs that are really emerging. And this is really where Africa's wealth is embedded. I know that um, the EDS was formerly working on issues of mining, right? We know that our mineral resources are a source of wealth and we can leverage them. But the youth entrepreneurs that we have been working with um, have really opened my eyes about how much we have such latent potential in fact, tomorrow we will have an event here where we are rewarding, we are rewarding two startups that came from a process that we started last year. We put out a call um, continent wide um, in English and French for innovative um, businesses that we wanted to come to the in traffic and trade fair. That was really the attraction. We were sponsoring 150 of them. Do you know we got 4,936 applications from 51 countries? And they were so interesting. Um, and, I mean, it was a real challenge for the committee um, to come through and identify the 150. But they went through a process of pitching, and, and finally, we had the final two. But the top one um, business that I wanted to tell you about the business is called Salubata. And Salubata. And Salubata is a brand that has been created by um, a young entrepreneur from Nigeria. and. He has he's using plastic bottles to create a really, really wonderful leisure wear, you know, shoes. 
and um, and he's going into production. I mean, he's going in, and uh, you know, he's not only going to be trading in Sofuku, I think he's talking to all the global platforms as well. So these are the kind of uh, you know things that we can do if we deliberately create this pipeline. That's what I'm trying to say, and we have started to do that, whereby we can have those products that um, can make it to the global market. But they are more interesting for us is the African market because we want Africans to buy African products, and that's one of our lessons learned, by the way. That um, as Africans, we need to develop that taste. There's a lady still touching my ear. I'm glad that um, the African Union, the Pan African, um, I think also are working on guidelines to, to define what we mean by Middle Africa because it cannot be okay. just a tagline with the tiger or something that um, has value. So I want to quickly move and towards as I move towards um, um, the, the next part of my presentation, and that is when to... you go into digital trade and the landscape, no, understand that what is happening. There are about 800 e commerce companies across the continent now. And the study that the research that's been done shows that many of them, frankly, are struggling. Why? Not because they don't have brilliant platforms or brilliant content concepts, but the, it, the lack of interoperable payment systems on the continent is a big downfall. So that's one. And the other, of course, is affordable logistics. So the AB Trade Group has set itself up to be one of the stakeholders seeking solutions. And we approved the African Union with the challenge of um, uh, you know, inter affordable finance and interoperable payment systems. And we know already we have hubs, right? That is already um, you know, piloted and rolling out. This is great. But we are coming with a different model because we are worried about the fintechs and the startups. So we have a multi-payment gateway that we are creating. And this is where the business opportunities come. So if you have a multi-payment data gateway and you have an interoperable payment system rolled out, what it means is that mobile payments, one is the method um, of the cards, all mm -hmm. kinds of payment options become available to small businesses. So they then the, so the consumer then chooses. So what we're doing is stimulating basically the financial services so, sector. So this one is already met first class. So I think we go this way. Jobs, That's what I understood. Affordable, by the way, because we're insisting, because we're so a social enterprise, less and then again, this has to be something that is going to be sustainable, but it builds an infrastructure and opportunities because remember, our goal is to create jobs. So we are working, of course, with the challenge of the regulatory environment, and I'm, I'm looking <laughs> to some of the experts who have been working on this. How do we get our central bank governments to understand that for it is not possible for us to roll out a continent-wide infrastructure when we have to go to individual countries to get the licensing. Of course, the license conditions are not the problem in themselves. It's the process. Right? It's the My God. And it's exactly the same disadvantage that SMEs are facing in terms of affordable finance because um, everybody talks about the fact we know what the challenge is, but let me give you this um, anecdote for those of you who um, are, you know, thinking about competitiveness. So in India and China, it takes between six to eight hours to apply for a loan online and you get a response, same day. In Africa, it can take anywhere from two months, three months, even six months. SMEs, I see lady then nodding at the back, right? <laughs> so what does that mean? It means that our businesses cannot even change strategy because they live in hope. It's like they're not they're not actually business people, they're in the business of applying and praying, you know. And and that's not how you run sustainable business. So we're saying the whole system is actually rigged against the hardworking SME. Because if you have to wait for that long, and the response may be, yes, you have the finance, the response may be that you don't have it. But we have young entrepreneurs and farmers who are applying for finance and are paying interest rates of 13 to 35%. How is that possible? I mean, I'm talking about case examples that we've come across in our work in promoting this platform. Um, so we have to 
finding solutions, and we are saying smart finance and digital banking is a part of it. Now, let me look to end with the logistics because this is where the, the real, real uh, transformation needs to happen. And this is where we need this year and your political and uh, your thinking, your think tank capacities to weigh in. We uh, started looking at, at an open source platform for what we call smart finance, fulfillment, and logistics. Because we think this is the essential infrastructure that is a, not yet integrated in the countries. We know we have the three PL transporters, the road transport networks, but we wanted to start with the aviation sector because of the open skies, because of the small parcels, and because we know that when they are transporting goods across the continent, and we have somebody ordering on Sokovo, any, any platform, the cost of transport is often higher than the value of the product itself. So clearly, we need to do something differently. So in the AMCFTA guided trade initiative, I was inspired to learn that Ron Baer has uh, announced that they're going to subsidize the cost of, uh, of shipments, you know, cargo for small businesses. Is this the one or the next one? Now, the this next is one? just one example. No, okay. That, but yeah. we next also partnering with the European Airline to the DHL and we're inviting all the uh, I don't have a Seven day guest from the first of ambassador to the water tower sense for passenger and cargo. And you can only do that yeah. in a framework where you're working together and deliberately thinking through how to do this to create opportunity, business opportunity, certainly that's what makes it sustainable. Um, but also creating an infrastructure for warehouses across the continent that are integrated with this technology so that. If somebody in Niger wants to order something from Kenya, they don't have to wait, you know, all that time for it to be delivered. We can actually have a smart <coughs> system. So we, as a trade, bringing the technology, but we're mobilizing the partnerships. So warehouses, uh, if we own warehouses because that's not our interest, suddenly that becomes part of our, our network because they can then benefit. From this um, this channel, if you have any minds, I will give a setup a fulfillment center for the airport. Get the process of investing in that because they've seen that opportunity. But our vision is that these hubs should be all over the continent. Okay, you can take the next the one. Infrastructure that Africa needs. The next uh, okay. picture. It's not something that we can wait for. We need to do it, and if we can mobilize the capital to do it because I, I we are seeing the picture. goods coming through, yeah. which is where industrialization is coming yeah. through, where aggregation yeah. models are coming through, where working with stakeholders, especially in, in agriculture and food, because that is what yeah. I think is yeah. imperative yeah. for all of us right now. So yeah. that's yeah. where the yeah. comes in as an enabler. And I think that, you know, my the end point I want to bring to my conversation that what digital trade and the fourth industrial revolution are teaching us is that we cannot continue to work in silos. This is not going to, we're not going to move the continent forward in this way. So I want to just appreciate this platform to discuss on how we can, from our humble beginning, because it is humble, but from our big thinking that we, we are going to, how can we leverage of the um, you know the uh, momentum from COP twenty seven to really um, create jobs on a large scale and also create visibility for what Africa produces so that even in the global community um, we can have goods shipped not just around the continent but from everywhere uh, in the world. Thank you very much. I'm going to concentrate on it and move from that new commission to go to a trade. I can ask Hi, myself one now. Okay. So basically, to go and transform. It should be this way, no? Everything that she read yeah. uh, under the SDFTA and her directorship to reality, because everything was we are seeing, what we are hearing. Yeah, now. and that's been a fed up that we want. Okay. Yeah. On that revision.
and this definitely government has to be able to be able to articulate the policies and strategy so as to best to target this sort of learning so that we don't discourage this sort of learning. I also want to talk about the issue of uh, Essentially, in Africa, we know the challenges we are facing in terms of the digitalization, and that is the reason why African government will be encouraged to invest in the digital infrastructure. But the other hand, uh, the level of change cannot be as expected. And that's why you see that my Bolivia are definitely linked to the issue of the Digitalization of jails, issue of green finance. Green finance, you know, it may be new, you know, that body has spoken much about the opportunities that are advanced everywhere. So, all of these have to be taken into consideration in the digitalization of the uh, African consumer, which is a new Thank you very much. I'm trying to turn the point across. Uh, let's move in. Okay. Let's <laughs> change the seat. Thanks, Nancy, for a nice bringing together uh, the various uh, strands of the conversation we had here. Uh, the best two speakers are uh, able to put uh, meetings together, uh, the linkages, uh, which indeed is the main thrust of uh, this panel. But critically, you've uh, been able to highlight uh, a framework that uh, is oftentimes, I mean, whose provisions are oftentimes uh, lost. Uh, that is the bear. Uh, and uh, if, if uh, we do not uh, address the priorities, the six priorities uh, laid out so nicely in the app. Uh, then the AFCFT may end up in the market for other people and not for Africans. Uh, so so I'm, I'm so glad you were able to bring that uh, on, on, on the table. Uh, the one thing that, uh, the one friend that holds the three presentations together that I may want to highlight uh, is the uh, reality of the fact that the AFCFT is not a classic trade agreement. It, it's beyond that. Uh, it, it is uh, a, a trade agreement that emphasizes productivity. Uh, and when you talk productivity, you're talking about industrialization. Uh, if Africa does not produce, again, then uh, we would be facilitating and uh, facilitating other actors to see the opportunities. Uh, so, so uh, these are. Uh, uh, issues I phrased, and uh, a lot more. I would not want to uh, rebutt what you've already said. I would just want to uh, open the floor uh, for uh, Q and A and observations and comments. Mm -hmm. So that is the case we get into now. So please uh, kindly just raise your hand indicate your uh, affiliation, name and affiliation, and then we'll get into Thanks. Uh, okay. I, I see a couple of hands. Let me start. Thank you very much. Sorry. I'd like to thank the presenter with the very valuable note. And I totally agree with what they have spoken. Mine will be more on suggestion and to see the way forward on all the activities going on about the industrialization. My name is Emma Kawawa from Tanzania. I represent the women cluster in business and I'm also in our business from private sector. And I also like to not thank Yuneka for bringing me here also. All in all, as the presenter spoke, I look it into the streamlined and a simplified way that the most important thing we need to have in mind is that the collaboration first, as straight, she stated, she said, stated it first, that we are working on silos. Some countries, some people, some organizations are working on silos. We need collective ideas. And to have this collective, 
we need to have a think tank. A think tank which goes down to the players. And I'm talking about the players is the SMEs. They should be inclusive, not excluded. They are the ones doing the business. We are doing a lot of discussions. We're doing a lot of research and all this, they are not part of it. This is what I would, I would see about. So that we know exactly what is needed. And as you speak about the trade, industrialization, I would suggest we start trading within our own continent, Africans to Africans. We need each other. We need raw materials. Some countries need to keep raw materials from another country. We always start down. We, we yes, we'll go for the global market, but also start trading with each other. Trading within each other has obstacles. As you see, the infrastructure. Coming to Benin, to Niger now, how do we travel? I do believe if I come from Tanzania, I have to go through Ethiopia. What should I look at a flight straight to Niger? We need to start this. Start this bring infrastructure, make new mechanism for us to trade together, to work together, so that we can produce. Maybe we can get one product here, another product from another country, and make a big produce and take it out of the country. And this is all about collaboration, as I say, online underscore, because we can't be speaking about being in Africa and we Africans are not talking to each other. It sounds a bit awkward. And then when you talk about the smart systems and we talk about the raw materials, can we have a simplified document? Is when I heard the first presenter saying we have 130 pages of the document to be read, to be understood on policies and finances. That is critical. We, as private sector, we need things which we are looking at the numbers and we're looking at something which is valuable to us to get this out. And last, I would say that we need to change the mindset of both the private sector and the finances. The finances have to be there to think how they can help the private sector. For example, the banks should be speaking to each other. Instead of EcoBank, which is based in Ghana, I'm just giving an example, and Tanzania having a bank, maybe a local bank, which is called maybe NMB, they should partner so that an SMB can buy products from Ghana by using the local currency. I know ECOWAS is doing very well, yes, but we need to see sub saharan versus West Africa. There's a lot to be done there. I can see a lot to be done there. Also, on the regulations of visas, again, it's another issue. We need to open up. We're speaking of working together, but there's still a lot of obstacles. Let's try and see and harmonize the policy makers. We should see. For example, in East Africa, I know we're doing very well. That one can nobody can like deny. Or Sadek, they're doing very well. It could be the same at ECOWAS, but come across, speak one language. Donc, euh, bonjour tout le monde. Euh, je me présente, euh, je suis Zaretin, euh, expert euh, des affaires économiques au sein de la communauté économique régionale euh, de l'Afrique du Nord. Donc, euh, tout d'abord, j'aimerais remercier le gouvernement du Niger pour l'hospitalité et la co-organisation réussite de cette semaine d'industrialisation de l'Afrique. Donc, je souhaite conclure également cette introduction sans remercier la CEA pour le travail mené en tant que partenaire stratégique pour le développement économique en Afrique sur le plan national, continental et régional. Pourquoi je conclue, conclue avec régional Parce que je représente une région qui fait partie de l'Afrique et nous avons bénéficié de l'assistance technique continue de la CEA et j'aimerais bien le remercier euh, devant ce panel. Euh, nous avons euh, actuellement formulé une demande pour l'innovation de stratégie régionale de l'ISO de la SECAF et ça tombe pas nommé puisque nous avons inclus dans le projet de référence les deux thématiques choisies au niveau 
Je ne sais pas très bien. Euh, malheureusement, nous n'avons pas encore euh, commencé euh, la réalisation de la stratégie. La demande a été formulée en mars 2022, mais pour les termes de référence, je pense qu'ils sont d'actualité. Dans ce sens, j'aimerais bien que Colibou Nassero nous active de leur part cet euh, engagement. Donc, euh, je passe directement euh, aux questions, ou bien plutôt aux remarques, pour les panélistes, que je remercie beaucoup pour euh, les informations détaillées et surtout pour les orientations stratégiques pour. Euh, pour qu'on puisse travailler ensemble. Pour élaborer des stratégies détaillées pour le développement de ces domaines. Donc, euh, une question précise euh, aux panélistes, aux premiers panélistes, sur la finance euh, euh, verte. En tant qu'investisseur, vous savez très bien pour assurer la durabilité d'un projet, il faut commencer par le début. Et le début de toute action de développement devrait commencer par l'éducation. Donc, est-ce que vous avez, euh, dans le cadre de vos attributions, le cadre de votre champ d'application, euh, donné une priorité ou réservé une attention particulière à ce domaine pour assurer une durabilité de la finance, de l'économie et de l'investissement vert. Euh, ma deuxième, euh, plutôt euh, témoignage, non pas remarque, envers euh, madame, euh, ma soeur euh, très jeune. Euh, je ne saurais que confirmer ce que M. Karimi a déjà dit et pour témoigner votre implication pour une Afrique meilleure. Nous avons travaillé ensemble pour l'élaboration du premier projet de la Zoréka. On est fiers. Maintenant, pour cette question spécifique du commerce électronique, je voudrais simplement partager avec euh, l'audience, surtout avec vous, euh, la demande officielle qu'on a euh, émise euh, au Népal, au de la de Népal, euh, pour l'élaboration d'un plan stratégique régional en matière de développement de commerce électronique. Mais ça va être toujours dans le cadre euh, global de la SNECA. Et on compte beaucoup sur votre assistance pour qu'on puisse ré réussir euh, cet objectif dans un cadre de, de, de coopération et de partenariat très parti. Je vous remercie. Absolutely, we, you know, we 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 survive or we die on the existence or the absence of collaboration, and I think that's really something that we need to become much um, more strategic and intentional in terms of driving the the levels and the layers um, of that strategic uh, collaboration and cooperation, and have some very unified goals around that. It's just coming together won't solve the issue. But I think we need to have a goal, as I mentioned before, having a cluster that is supply led does not solve the offtake issue, does not solve the access to market issue. 
So I think we have to have a very strategic framework of intent um, that can give us the objective that we want and then build an ecosystem that, that can accomplish that. So that's a really great, uh, great point. And I think, I think that also leads into what uh, your colleague uh, also shared in terms of education. Um, we're in the knowledge economy. Uh, the, the education, uh, you know, equipping you know, our businesses and our ecosystem to understand how to attract, um, manage, maintain, and grow assets and opportunities is fundamental. And, and, and one of the things we have noticed, if you just look at the infrastructure space, a lot of focus has typically been on governments to investors. And if you actually look at the actual players that have developed the projects called infrastructure project developers, there's not even a professional network or an education or professionalization system uh, in place to actually help you know, those particular players. And I think it runs through many different levels of the, the sort of the private sector as well. So that's just my long way of saying absolutely agree that education is a key part of it. We do what we can as the investment community and we seek to share all of that information and that education in the Just Transition Investors Alliance. That is, we, we work with academia and we're going to be working with the, the, the chambers of commerce who are one of the key partners. And even myself, I used to represent the Africa Board for an organization called Junior Achievement, where we actually go into schools um, and we right across the continent and around the world to talk about entrepreneurship, I'm talking about how to attract and manage and you know, manage finance, the difference between finance and investment, equity and debt. Um, but of course, I completely agree, a lot more needs to be done when we're now talking about mobilizing trillions within a decade. Um, so thank you very much for those important questions. Uh, thanks. Uh, let me, uh, oh, Madame. Uh, I think I have to use this one. I want to thank um, both of the interveners, um, and uh, I, I think my sister said it all. There's really nothing more to add, except just to recognize the important role of uh, women uh, claiming the space and providing leadership to the AFCFT. If we don't do it deliberately, it won't happen. So I think this is the only comment I would make. And to my brother, I want to thank you because today you have warmed my heart. We are all about partnerships and partnerships at different levels. And I think what you have shared today publicly about the potential of a continental AU organization, working with a regional organization, working with an entity like AEK Group potentially as a partner, public-private partnership in our own way, in our own model, to me could be very exciting. What is exciting for us is just the fact getting on and doing the job. This is really what we need to do. So I want to thank you also for your kind words. I was just a civil servant. <laughs> I, I was lucky to be where I was at the AFCFTA. And I want to say, because this is an ECA forum, um, ECA should be proud to have been also part of really well. They were, they're not visible, they cannot speak about it, they cannot thump their chest, but I can. I can recognize that and I can say to you honestly that the platforms to connect us that you create, the knowledge that you provide, the encouragement um, is really what makes a difference as a development actor. So thank you for that. Uh, Prof. Uh, it doesn't matter to uh, what you ask because uh, uh, it's related to the opportunity uh, to learn about Asia. And uh, I just want to encourage to make an opportunity to uh, expand uh, this kind of opportunity, especially to raise the awareness about the PRAT because this is critical. All the other people that are uh, uh, one of the investments mentioned, we are we are very with serious commitment about the implementation of the GIT framework. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Prof. I am not sure there are any uh, for that. I don't seem to see any, so we would be uh, wrapping up.
Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, Andy Chet, who left, I just occupied his seat uh, very briefly. So let's clap for my boss. Uh, we have been informed that the representative of uh, the Honorable Minister is here, uh, uh, Mr. Asu Mane. So please, uh, okay, uh, be joining us uh, for the uh, closing uh, session. Please. So uh, let, let me uh, pass the floor to uh, uh, the yes, Madam uh, yes, that will be followed by the minister's script. Thank you very much, um, uh, Excellencies, distinguished guests. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, and uh, I have the uh, tough task of uh, giving concluding remarks on a fascinating uh, discussion. Thanks to all the uh, panelists and the insightful uh, interventions they have made. Um, I think I've, uh, I have a, a very eloquent uh, speech by the team prepared, but let me deviate from that and give you my thoughts on the discussion that we had today. Uh, I think the, uh, this discussion comes in a very timely uh, context globally because all over the world, you know, uh, the uh, global value chains have been disrupted by the pandemic and then by the war in Ukraine. Uh, everyone around the world is now trying to actually move their value chains regionally. And at the same time, we have this fantastic opportunity by the African Continental Free Trade <laughs> Agreement that offers us the, the, the chance to actually do that in a far more meaningful way than we ever had. Um, I believe that you know we, you know the African Continental Free Trade Agreement offers uh, uh, fantastic opportunities in various ways. We've talked about you know trading in goods and services. There are also areas like you know pooling, energy pooling, and how this can serve really meet the continent's energy deficit. Uh, uh, there is a huge opportunity to also go beyond the trading in goods and services to really the harmonizing of regulation for investment. Uh, that, you know, once you uh, in, in one country, you, you're with the same type of harmonized regulation, you can expand across the continent. This is an area where we really need to advance on. There is also what we have heard about, the payment systems, and how this can actually help us reduce all the risks that many of the private sector have to deal with in terms of currency exchange risk. The, the fact that we can use our own local currencies to you know, uh, pay uh, cross-border within the continent. This is a very promising area. So um, also, of course, we have challenges. And for me, I feel very strongly about the fact that we need to be able to move across border and move goods and services and individuals across the continent at a much easier pace. We cannot be flying to, through Europe and wanting to integrate you in the continent. We need to have open skies, we need to have ease of movement and a cheaper cost of transporting the goods within the continent. So I think these points have been really well made during the discussion. And these are areas that we need to continue uh, to focus on. But also we have discussed during today's uh, uh, panel, uh, areas of digitalization and how this can really help us advance the agenda. I think uh, we are fortunate in a way sometimes, you know, uh, doing it later gives you an advantage because you can build on all the advances that have made, been made. We can actually leapfrog. We can use what has, you know, been achieved elsewhere to do it better. And that's our opportunity to actually build on the innovation that exists. But more importantly, I think uh, having the innovations that are grown locally that works. I think we've seen before Kenya lead the way mobile banking and it was built by the need that they had within the farm. We need more of these innovations to advance on integration and digitalization. 
so that we can actually harness the potential of the regional integration within uh, the continent and leapfrog uh, our way going forward. Uh, I think we have uh, many opportunities. I, I think I would fear to really kind of like, you know, count them. <laughs> Perhaps just point of view, um, including, for example, the, the huge opportunities that we have related to renewable energy. We have 40% of the global potential for renewable energy. We have a huge potential for green mining. We have, for example, some studies show that in DRC, the cost of cursor reducing cursor batteries is 15 to 20% lower than China and the US. Uh, we have also seen uh, studies and, uh, uh, that looks at uh, issues of like green investing within the continent and how this can actually lead to higher value addition and higher jobs. And we also have seen the fact that we have all the, the, the raw material of fertilizers, yet many countries still import. And this is why some of the work that is being done in UCA, like you know, having this Alex platform, provide a great opportunity, not just for us to be able to understand the needs uh, and the supply and the amount within the continent, but the areas in which we can actually grow this interregional trade and industrialize. Uh, so I, I really what I wanted to say is that opportunities are abundant. And it now is the time we have a you know a chance once in uh, generations, chance to actually make it work with what we have achieved in terms of progress in the African continental free trade agreement. And I hope that these discussions fascinating discussions are just the beginning to action and thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Madam B. Yes, uh, for those uh, very important points. Uh, let me uh, now pass the microphone to the, uh, Mr. Asmon. Okay. Well, Merci, et Madame la Secrétaire exécutive de la Agence de la CIA, Monsieur le Modérateur, euh, Mesdames et Messieurs, et tout votre la conservé, Monsieur le Ministre du Plan, Docteur Ravi, avions voulu être présent au niveau de ce panel, et il a même confirmé, même pour des contraintes de dernière heure, notamment, comme vous le savez, le budget est en train de préparer la table ronde pour le financement du plan de développement économique et social. Il a été appelé à la présidence. Donc, c'est ce qui a fait que en fait, il n'est pas aujourd'hui avec vous. Mais du fait qu'il tient à marquer tout l'intérêt qu'il a à ce panel et aussi à ce grand forum, donc il, il, il nous a demandé, et, moi, Menassa Asouman, directeur général de la planification et de la programmation de l'Union de Guinée, pour prononcer un mot et en même temps vous témoigner que c'est une thématique très importante à l'ère de la mise en œuvre de la ZLECA, la zone de libre et, 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 et africaine. Donc il faut noter que pour le cas spécifique du Niger, nous venons de boucler la formulation du PDS 2022-2026, qui a placé au cœur la transformation structurelle de l'économie. C'est un des axes, le troisième axe du plan de développement économique et social. Alors, qui dit transformation structurelle de l'économie Bien sûr, donc, euh, en fait, la thématique que nous venons de voir donc, est placée au cœur. Euh, il faut d'abord euh, favoriser la compétitivité et soutenir aussi le développement de l'Afrique. Oui, ça a été ajouté à l'ère du Niger. Le Niger a élaboré ce qu'on appelle le plan stratégique Niger 2.0. Le plan stratégique Niger 2.0 et il met un focus sur une initiative très novatrice, notamment les villages intelligents. Je pense que vous en avez entendu parler. Les villages intelligents, c'est une, 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 une initiative qui permet de développer l'utilisation du numérique pour l'agriculture, l'utilisation du numérique dans le domaine social, mais aussi dans le domaine de la, de la gouvernance. Toutes les thématiques qui concourent au développement durable sont adressées à ce niveau, au niveau des différents villages. Nous avons fait une expérimentation au niveau donc, euh, des villages. Aujourd'hui, avec euh, l'appui d'un partenaire, nous sommes engagés 
à aller au-delà, à mettre donc à l'échelle cette initiative. Le deuxième élément du plan stratégique Niger 2.0, c'est ce qu'on appelle la cité de l'innovation. La cité de l'innovation aussi, c'est un socle pour améliorer la compétitivité des petites et moyennes entreprises. À ce moment-là, tous les services sont offerts aux entreprises en termes de formation, mais aussi, bien sûr, la plateforme numérique pour pouvoir d'abord commercialiser, notamment à travers le e-commerce. La troisième thématique, c'est ce qu'on appelle le e-gouvernement. Le e-gouvernement qui permet donc en fait, de moderniser l'administration avec moins de papier à et avec une meilleure communication au niveau des différentes institutions. L'autre élément qui a été le sur le de cette thématique, c'est la finance, la finance verte. Nous venons de sortir de la COP27 et il faut dire que le leader, donc avant la COP27, dans le cadre de la stratégie du développement durable et de croissance inclusive Niger 2035, a pris en question, en compte, la question de la finance verte en partisan. Le premier élément, c'est d'abord qu'il faut intégrer la préoccupation du changement climatique dans la planification. C'est ce que nous avons fait dans la SDDC du Niger 2035, qui est déterminée dans des plans régionaux, notamment le PDS 2017-2021 et le PDS 2022-2026. Alors, pour accompagner ce processus, nous, sommes, nous avons engagé d'abord la formation. Et nous avons et, des, des institutions qui sont à, et, accréditées avec la batterie. Nous venons de mobiliser un financement. Certes, c'est un petit financement de 10 millions de dollars, mais il faut comprendre que ça, c'est un financement catalytique. Ce financement catalytique va nous permettre de faire en sorte de mieux comprendre d'abord la, la finance verte. Et deuxièmement, quels sont ces différents instruments pour aller à l'échelle Donc, et en pour aller à la transformation structurelle de l'économie, bien sûr, il faut industrialiser notre économie. Nous étions à un taux d'industrial, la, le taux de la, la, la production intérieure du secteur industriel était à moins de 10 Il faut aller développer davantage ce secteur, le secteur secondaire pour que le secteur secondaire puisse prendre le pas par rapport au, au secteur primaire. Globalement, et, 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 donc ce sont des initiatives que nous sommes en train de développer. Donc nous sommes vraiment très satisfaits que ce panel se tienne et que beaucoup de messages forts puissent être capitalisés dans le cadre de ce de nous Sur ce, donc, nous allons analyser et monsieur le modérateur, a fait un travail vraiment grave euh, en faisant en sorte vraiment de parler des différents modérateurs à l'aide du fond avec des stages qui sont les autres et des chapeaux à tout le monde. Et donc, ce sujet, nous déclarons les autres pour nous, les présents de la manière. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. 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 Th